will lead us to a major conjecture of Serge Lang, and we'll discuss that. Uh, in fact, the way it's written, it, it seems like one hour per lecture, but that's not true. In fact, I would wish to spend all of the time on lecture two, but it's not going to be possible. So I'll, uh, well, I, I think lecture two will not start on uh, Wednesday. It will start before, okay? At least that's my aim. Uh, the minimal model program is, is what uh, Brendan uh, learned uh, when he participated in that uh, seminar 13 years ago. It's a beautiful theory, and I'll only teach you about the beautiful stuff, because there's also ugly stuff there, and I'll completely ignore it. Okay? And that's, where, that's one topic that I think number theorists should know more about. And I think uh, Yuri must have alluded to some of the things that come up there. The last lecture, maybe I will get to it, maybe I, I won't. Uh, it tries to tie together some of the, of the notions that will occur earlier. All right, so let me start. Um, start by uh, following what, uh, basically, so I should say. Well, so uh, here's, here's, a, here's a statement. Geometry determines arithmetic. Already in the first lecture of Chinkel, we heard, I guess I wasn't there, but uh, it's a collective uh, world, we heard that this is complete nonsense because there's a theorem that says that arithmetic is complicated, more complicated than anything you can imagine, right? There's a theorem that, that uh, you'll find any equations cannot be solved in general. But that does not stop us from working in arithmetic geometry, does it? So what we try to do is throw away some of the randomness and some of the ambiguities and concentrate on things that are determined by geometry. Um, so the word geometry, I'll concentrate on the birational geometry of a variety X <coughs> over a number field K. There's other geometries you can study and which will occur in other lectures probably, but I don't know enough about them to say anything. Um, Arithmetic uh, is what we've heard about all along, uh, rational and integral point, at least after a field extension. So one major point where I try to get rid of, of, of the randomness is by allowing myself to extend the base field, uh, which is somewhat in contrast to what uh, Darmo has been doing in his lectures. And uh, what does the term mean? Well, that's to be determined. Um, All right, so the first topic is what the Amon's lecture, lectures were about last week, is about closed curves, namely a projective algebra, smooth projective algebraic curves over number fields usually. And to summarize what Damon has been telling us, I guess you, I wasn't there, but um, uh, your lectures are not on the web yet. Okay, so, so to summarize, we can, there's, there's, a, there's an invariant that tells us what we should expect the arithmetic of a curve to behave like. And the invariant is uh, the genus, or the way I want to think about it from here on, is uh, 2 g minus 2, which is the degree of the of the divisor, divisor of a differential, of a, of a canonical differential. So if I look at uh, algebraic curves whose uh, 2g minus 2 is non-positive, so this, is, this means curves of genus 0 and curves of genus 1. If I take such a curve over a number field, well, it might have no points at all, but I know that, that that's an accident, that if I extend the field, as I suggest here, uh, here, if I extend the field, I remove some of this ambiguity that is so interesting and so important for people like Dalmont. But uh, if I want to say something about this, this nonsense geometry that determines arithmetic, I have to do this trick of, of getting rid of some of the, um, of the ambiguities. 
So this is what I call potentially, well, I'll say that in a minute. And if the, if the g, 2 g minus 2, if the genus is positive, if, uh, bigger than one, sorry, namely 2 g minus 2 is positive, then uh, we have uh, finite. So let me, so in other words, uh, rational points on a curve C of genus G are potentially dense if and only if the genus is less than or equal to one. Where potentially dense means dense is this risky topology, which for a curve just means infinite, right? For an algebraic curve, dense means, in the risky topology means infinite. And other topologies, are, again, are important. I will not refer to lectures from last week. Uh, are potentially dense if and only if the genus is less than or equal to one. Uh, so potentially dense, I said what potentially dense is, and I, I need to say what, what KC is. So, so KC is a divisor class. That's the usual terminology used in birational geometry, although geometers have this bad habit of confusing divisor class and line bundles. So I'll try to avoid this, but I am a geometer, so I will do it. I can guarantee, almost. <laughs> so. So OC of KC, so, so KC is a divisor class. I take the associated invertible sheaf, which I really confuse with line bundles, okay? I never uh, distinguish between them. So that, that sheaf is the sheaf of one differentials on C of holomorphic differentials if you are a geometer or algebraic ge differentials if, if you are an algebraic geometer, which for curves is the same as the dualizing sheaf that occurs in cell duality, omega C. Let me just say a word about this. Uh, we know uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the case where a genus is less than or equal to one, this, this table says, or this, this uh, displayed statement says that the rational points are potentially dense. Well, you just do it. How do you show this? You just do it by hand. OK, so what do I mean by do it by hand? If you are on a rational curve, well, on a curve of genus zero, then you know that it becomes rational uh, over an extension of a de degree at most two. And once it's rational, you just write your points. They are there. For a, an, a curve of genus one, that's a little bit more of a problem. So the first thing, the, the major problem is to find one point. And for that, you might need to take an arbitrary degree of an extension. But once you have one point, you, are, you have an elliptic curve by, by Damon's terminology. No, you, you might have still only finitely many points on an elliptic curve. But after a further quadratic extension, there will be infinitely many. So that, that's over a number field, there will be infinitely many. So that, that's, that's easy. The case of genus bigger than one, that's a major theorem that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that took one lecture of Damon's uh, lecture series, which is the theorem, theorem of Faltings, which has an, enjoyed many uh, new, uh, many further proofs later on, at least one major proof by Faltings, um, that uh, if C is an algebraic curve of genus bigger than one over a number field K, then the, uh, the, the set of rational points on that curve is finite. Now, you also had a lecture by Chinkel about integral points. Uh, uh, which touched on, on things that Darmon also covered, but I don't have Darmon's lectures on the web, so I, I'm just guessing that he... Uh, which, uh, of course, you, uh, you can talk about projective algebraic curves, but you can also talk about affine algebraic curves. And if you think about it, rational points on an affine algebraic curve are almost like rational points on its completion. You just, when you add a few points and you get the completion. So rational points are not a further interest. But there is something, uh, for instance, on the affine line, so just coordinate x, you can be interested in the integer coordinates. And integral points are indeed interesting on the affine line, but you have to be careful. <laughs> because if you take the affine line, well, the affine line is defined over the rational numbers, right? 
so you can, you can cook up a, an automorphism of the affine line which sends x to one half x, right? This is an automorphism defined over q. This is an automorphism of the affine line over q, which in particular sends the point x equals one to the point x equals one half. And this is not an element in, in any definition that you would want to have. This is not an integral point, right? It, it's not an integer coordinate. So what this says is that just working over your field is not enough. And that was a major point that Schinkel uh, made in his lecture. In order to make sense of integral points, you have to work with a model of your variety, in this case a curve, over the ring of integers, or something like the ring of integers. Otherwise, it is not an invariant notion. In other words, for open varieties, we use integral points on integral models, on models, on, on schemes defined over some, some base scheme, which is the spectrum of the ring of integers. We'll get to this in a moment. What I want to point out, if C is an affine curve with completion C, uh, I'll, I'll use the, no, uh, the terminology uh, sigma for whatever is left over. C bar minus C equals, this is a set of points that we throw out. Probably Chinkel used another uh, terminology, but um, I forgot to check it out. Uh, and I want to have something that is analogous to the canonical sheaf uh, on, uh, to the, to the sheaf of differentials on a, on a, on a projective curve. And the, anal the best analog we know of is the divisor class <coughs> KC plus the, no the points um, removed, taken with multiplicity one. This is called the, sh the divisor of a logarithmic differential. So I, I think I, I should I should revisit this in a minute. Let me just put this up. Go over here. Make sure I'm on track. All right, so, um, so if you recall, you might not recall from Chinkel's lecture, um, You replace the number field K with a ring of, of integers, basically. So, so just working of, over the ring of integer itself is not going to be sufficient for me. I want to also invert a few primes. So S is a finite set of primes, uh, if you want prime ideals. So, so this, is, this is the same as. I would write it this way if the primes were really principal, but in general, you can think about what, what this means. It's, you know, you can, you can, you can work with just okay with, with, with some element inverted. That's interesting enough. So the base scheme I will work with is the spectrum of this. <coughs> and what I have, the picture I have, here's C. And I add a, a few points, so this is, so C bar is what I get by completing it. Here's spec K. And here's my picture, a la Mumford, of spec K OKS. If you look at Mumford's book, he introduce this ridiculous picture of the spectrum of a number ring. Of course, it's just a bunch of points, but a prime. But. And um, so I take a scheme uh, which spreads out. I just take the equations, if you wish, of C bar and take those equations over OKS. That gives me a scheme over OKS. And so that I will call C bar, and here's the points of sigma. So this will, I'll call sigma bar. So the closure of the points of sigma will give me some, um, 
and the complement I'll, I'll call C. In fact, I can take any model of C, any scheme whose restriction to spec A is C, but it's usually more convenient to take just the complement of the of sigma bar in some com completion. Um, so now I need to define what integral points is in general, and uh, this is again, I recall what Schinkel did for you uh, last week. Um, an integral point in, so if I have a point here, a point P, I, I can think of it as a section from spec K to C. And once I have that, I can look at its closure. Uh, so that would be just a rational point. Uh, but I declare it to be an integral point if it's a schematic point of this model C. So if it is really a section of the open, open part C of, so it really lands in a scheme C, not C bar, in which I'm interested. So these are exactly, uh, to recall what Schinkel said, these are exactly the rational points such that at every prime, <coughs> the reduction of, the, of this, this point to this prime does not meet the points of sigma. So here's a, here's a non-integral point. This is not allowed. Okay. I just want to point out that if you take a proper curve, then the fact that when you take the closure of P, you get something that is a section, means that for proper curves, I haven't changed the notion. So for instance, for P1, integral points are the same as rational points. That's another thing that Schinkel told you last week. On a proper curve, if you don't throw away things, this is nothing new. Okay, so, so that's, that's the, this discussion. And here's the analog of what we had for complete curves for uh, when we are, uh, search for an analog for open curves. We have a table that says that the invariant that I claimed is the right analog actually is the right analog. So if I take the degree of the sheaf of logarithmic differentials, and compare with integral points, then indeed, uh, if 2g minus 2 plus n is less than or equal to 0, <coughs> the integral points are potentially dense. And if 2g minus 2 plus n, so that if the degree is bigger than 0, then the points are finite. Again, uh, let me just, uh, before I, I explain why this is true, Potentially dense, uh, I need to explain that, uh, and that's because there's w one little, so one example that I will, I will tell you about in a minute is that of the multiplicative group, which is an affine curve defined by the equation x times y equals one. And you know that over q, there are only finitely many solutions, namely plus or minus one for x and plus or minus one for y, but over a number field, uh, I guess, not every number. If, uh, if, if n1 plus n2 is bigger than one, uh, then, um, then uh, so if, if uh, the, the re uh, yeah. So over, over a number field, which is not just a quadratic imaginary field, there are solutions, there are infinitely many solutions. So this is, these are the unit in, okay. But if I look at a similar equation, which is isomorphic to this over, the, over Q, then I, whatever ring of integers I will take, I will have no solutions, <laughs> right? So the point is that extending the number field is not enough. I need to also throw in the S's. I need to invert. <laughs> So need one half. So without doing that, the, the, this statement is not true. So that, uh, that's at least one reason why to introduce S integral points into the picture. This is not really the reason, but 
but certainly you see that it's, it's, it's necessary there. So since I've written this example, I already can tell you why. The, so we have already almost dealt with all the cases here. Uh, the, the exception, uh, the one case, the, the, the two cases uh, we have not looked at is P1 minus one point, which I'll call zero, and P1 minus two points, which I'll call zero, uh, or maybe I'll call this infinity, zero and infinity. Of course, not every curve of genus zero with a uh, degree two divisor removed is one of these, but uh, it becomes one of these after an extension, so that's why I need to extend the field. Um, and then, in this case, in the affine line, you can write infinitely many integral points. We know them, the integers. And on the affine line minus two points, you need to go to a number field to get units. And if you indeed have something like this, then you might need to invert some, some primes. So uh, I've already done it on the board, so I don't need to write anything here. The case, the, the case where the, there's a finite net statement, again, is, 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 is the case where there's a true arithmetic um, content there. We already mentioned Falting's theorem in the case of genus bigger than one. There are still a couple of cases, namely um, an elliptic curve with a point removed, at least one point removed, or um, um, rational curve with at least three points removed. These both fall under the older theorem, the older theorem than Falting's, which says that if you have any fine curve, so either n bigger or equal to three or the genus bigger than zero and n bigger than zero, then for any of these affine curves, any of the affine curves, affine cases that fall in the second line, then for any integral model of, of your curve, the set of integral points is finite. So that's something that predates Faltings and uh, the techniques that go in there definitely are used in, in uh, proving Faltings' theorem. Siegel's lemma, but, but sir, one of the really, uh, one of the holy grails of this subject is people want to have a, a way of deducing Faltings' theorem directly from a Siegel type result. Uh, that would be really wonderful and one expects that it, it would give us better results on Faltings, uh, uh, but what? I know, I know, I know. I, I know I'm repeating things that you have done. So, uh, but, uh, but what I want to point out now is that, uh, in fact, the, the other direction has been known for a while. And it has already occurred in, <coughs> in the lectures. Uh, I mean, the techniques occurred in the lectures of Damon, and the only reason I know that is that he alluded to it today. And uh, I, I guess it occurred in the exercises, uh, this actual thing. So the, the main point is that, that Domo uh, introduced last week for this purpose is the fact that rational, and, and he mentioned it today too, that rational integral point can be controlled in finite et al cover, and finite unramified covers. I guess for number theorists, I should not use et al, but I should use unramified. Which is the same thing, but it uh, has an older uh, history in, in, the, in the number theory uh, world. <clears throat> Namely, you have a finite and ramified ex, uh, cover of uh, algebraic curves, then at least away from some discriminant, if you invert uh, some discriminant, then you can say any, ra any rational point downstairs becomes not necessarily a rational point. If you pull it up, it's not a rational point, but there's a, f a particular field, one algebraic number field, over which it becomes rational. So here's, here's, here's I'll, I'll just review what's behind what Damon uh, probably taught you last, last week. There's a theorem of Hermit Minkowski, which says that if K is any number field, as S is a finite ses, a set of, of finite places, of primes, and of non-zero prime ideals, let's say, 
and d is a positive integer, there are only finitely many extensions of the grid, most d, unramified outside s. That's a theorem of a classic theorem of Hermit Minkowski. In particular, it, it's used in understanding that, that uh, if you fix the degree and discriminant of a number field, that's a good measure of how big the number field is. There are only finitely many within this, this, uh, this ball. Okay, you can, uh, for each degree and uh, size of degree and discriminant, you make a sack of all the number fields, and it's, it's not so heavy because it's finite. <coughs> But for our purposes, you can deduce from this is that if you have an, a finite tal morphism of schemes over the ring of S integers, OKS. And since I'm a geometer, I'll actually attempt to draw something like this. So these ramified points are, are removed. And so, the, so I want the morphism to be a tal, unramified, so there, there no, and I want it to be finite so that I can pull up points from downstairs. Uh, then there is a finite extension. There's a, a fixed finite extension, <coughs> which is exactly what you have here, such that if you take the, the set S prime lying over S, and then any, uh, any integral points on y, so this is y and this is x, any integral point of y pull up, pulls up anything in the inverse image is a, an integral point on x, not over the same field and not the same s, but over the, the bigger field. Uh, and... Uh, Okay, so it's good to know that this was an, a, an exercise last time because I can now, okay, so on the geometric side, we have an all, all topological result. So, so what, what do we want to, to do? We want to uh, take a curve uh, a, a Ziegel curve, a curve with 2g minus 2 plus n positive, a curve which we want to show has only finitely many integral points. We want to produce an etal cover by another curve, so we know that, uh, that integral points downstairs are bounded by integral points over some field upstairs, but in order to use faultings, we want to have the curve upstairs have big genus. And that's what the geometric result tells us. If C is an open curve with 2G minus 2 plus N bigger than 0, and let's take, I, I don't actually need, I don't actually need N bigger than 0 for this. I don't know why I wrote that. Uh, Define over number field. There is a finite extension uh, of number fields, and a finite, so here's, here's my curve C. So there might be some, some sigma here. But in, in fact, I don't need it. There's a finite extension, a finite and ramified covering, so, which means that it's a finite covering of the complete curves, which is unramified away from the points of sigma, <coughs> such that the genus upstairs, this is the curve D, such that the genus upstairs is bigger than, uh, bigger than uh, one. Okay, and, and once you have this, you can use, uh, you can use the theorem of Chevalier-Vey to say, well, okay, I'll take an integral point downstairs. Well, I have to take an integral model. So I, what I need to do is I, I need to extend both C and D to an integral model. And if I do it right, then at least after inverting some primes, I'll have an unramified cover of the integral model, so the integral model of D will be unramified over the integral model of, of C. That's only true after throwing away some primes, but that's okay. And therefore, every integral point downstairs will become an integral point upstairs, in particular, a rational point upstairs, and by faultings, there are only finitely many. So how do you do this? Well, that was an ex exercise last time, but uh, 
And you know, you, you, can, you can just do it by hand, right? If you, if, for instance, if you take <coughs> P1 with three points removed, you can take your, your usual cover. You can start with the, your usual cover of P1 by taking, uh, you know, an n-fold cover that is branch over zero and infinity by just taking an nth root of t. And then you can take another cover that is branch over zero and or maybe one at infinity, which is obtained by taking an nth root of uh, t minus one, I, I guess. And then take the join of those. And if you do such things, you'll get a, a curves of bigger, of genes bigger than one. And that's fun to do. So since it was an exercise, you might as well pursue it if you haven't yet. There's a case, the case of an elliptic curve with one point removed is also a, a, an interesting case. Uh, so, so in that case, you, you need to do a little more. You first need to cover the elliptic curve by, by one, of, one of its uh, uh, usual et al covers by the, the isogeny. And then you have many points on the elliptic curve. And if, if you're careful, you... All right, so uh, that was an exercise. I'll leave it as that. I'll, I'll leave it as that. All right, how am I doing? All right. This way. I had, I'm, I'm jet lagged, therefore I had too many coffees today, which means I'm going too fast and you'll have to stop me. I'm not going to stop myself, okay? So if you have, questions, uh, you should not let me just rush ahead. <clears throat> right. We have learned, did we, did we learn uh, last week that um, anything over number fields, not anything, but many things over number fields have good analogs over function fields, and the study of this analogy has been a very, very fruitful way of understanding what to expect to be true over number fields, and, uh, and I mean, in general, I, mean, I, think, I think a big contribution of Grothendieck's development of the theory of schemes is, is from this analogy. <clears throat> So if K is the function field of a complex variety B, then the variety X, a variety of X over K can be thought of as the generic fiber of a scheme, script X over B. So, uh, so here's B. Here's the, <laughs> the generic point, spec K. And here your variety X, and you can kind of sort of spread it out there might be some very, very singular fibers, of course, but you can uh, try to spread it out to some scheme over B. A K-rational point can be thought of as, so if you have a K-rational point, you can take its closure. So its closure will be some, something that looks like this. It might have some, so you, it's almost like a, a section of, of script X over B, but it might have some poles. So, uh, so it's, it's really a rational section of X to B. You just take the closure, that's a scheme of degree one over B, namely it's birational to B, so it's almost a tautology to say that it's a rational section of in case the dimension of B is one, and in case X over B is proper, then just as we had uh, in a previous transparency, <coughs> I mean, you take the closure of, some, you get something of degree one over B, the closure will not have any fibral components. So the, the violative criterion for properness means that you actually have a regular section B of X in the case of dimension B equals one. So really you have a uh, relationship between rational point on X and section of script X. So that, that's a way to give a geometric meaning to rational points when you work over, number, over, over function fields. <clears throat> and uh, so this is a, an analogous situation to the question of rational points over 
number fields. And uh, the, the analog of Moldell's conjecture, namely the, the theorem of Faltings, was proven many, many years before, uh, before Faltings proved uh, the Moldell conjecture over number fields. In this situation, assume that the genus of C is bigger than one, then the rational points are, the set of rational points are finite with one caveat. So here's a picture. <coughs> now, here's a point C, a curve C naught, and you can always if you have a, a variety B, you can always form C naught cross B, which maps to B. And if C naught has infinitely many points, uh, look, I've, I've said B is a complex variety, so any curve over the complex numbers has infinitely many complex points. Then there will be many, many, many points like this, namely the constant points. So what uh, Grout, Manning and Grout actually prove is that assuming that genus is bigger than one, there are only finitely many non-constant points. So they prove exactly what you expect to be true. Uh, but they are rational over the complex numbers. So I'm thinking about, <coughs> so the, the function field of B is a function field over the complex numbers. So it, sections are going to be just sections over the complex numbers. But this is not arithmetic, really. It's ge geometry. So I'll, I'll get back to your, question, to your point in a minute, what happens when this is not over a complex number, but over, OK. Right. Yeah, so, 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 so the, the theorem is particularly geometric in, the, in this particular case because what it says, <coughs> so what's a rational point here? A rational point is a section from B to B cross C naught, but what's, the, what's a section, the data of a section? Well, we know how, how a point of B will have to map to itself on a point. So a section is just a graph of a map from B naught to C. And the theorem of the Francis says that there are only finitely many non-constant non ones. And you can actually say something about how many in terms of, of the, the way the Jacobians uh, look and so on. <clears throat> so that's the theorem of Manin and Grauet. Now, uh, back to your point. Instead of working over the complex number, let's, let's pull back and say, well, function fields can still have some arithmetic content if these are function fields of varieties over Q or over a number field. Namely, these are fields that are finitely generated over Q. And if you combine the theorem of Mann and Grout and the theorem of Faltings, you can immediately prove that, that I think that's one of the exercises in my... I, I hope everybody knows that there are lecture notes available. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if everybody, I mean, certainly you have access to them on the computer. Um, and there's, I, there's an incomplete set of exercises there, but I think it will keep you busy for this week. Um, right, so you can combine this easily, and that's an exercise, and prove that this, I still call it Faltings' theorem, that, uh, and I would not be surprised if Faltings actually mentions it in one of his papers, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if C is a curve of genus bigger than one over a field which is finitely generated over Q, so these are slightly more general, arithmetically interesting fields, then the set of K rational points, you don't need to worry about non-constant in that case because of that point exactly. Uh, the set of K rational points is finite. Okay? Combination of manning grauet and the earlier stated theorem of Faltings. All right. 
that ends lecture zero. So questions about curves. What I, so the reason I did this very elaborate uh, review is A, probably nobody, nobody complains about the review, right? And second, uh, I need to draw some, some points from the curve case in order to seek for analogies in higher dimension. So uh, remember what I said in the beginning, geometry determines arithmetic. That's true for curves. All these theorems say that's true. 2g minus 2 plus the number plus n determines the arithmetic of the curve up to, okay, so it doesn't determine completely because we want to count these points, you want to measure these points, you want to know many things, but at least in the, in the low level sense, it does determine. Anything in high, almost anything in higher dimension is conjectural, yes? Arbitrary fibration with fiber isomorphic to. Oh yes, yes. Let. <coughs> so this is this is. Here I did not. I I stated here just the, the rational point case. So the way I stated it, I don't need a fibration. Oh, you mean this theorem? This theorem. Yeah, this is true in general. This is a, again. This is a theorem about about function fields. You, I, I, I don't need to choose the model in order to state the theorem. I, I chose the model in order to explain, ah, oh, there is a point, thank you. There is a point, so uh, I chose the model in order to, ex, to explain the geometric underpinning of what this means, but also if you want to work with integral points, which I haven't mentioned here, it's mentioned a little bit in the lecture notes, uh, you have to choose just a vibration. Or the number of a possible fibration with the same generic fiber, that's infinite. You can always take a point here and blow it up. So you, you'll have to, there is, there is a whole theory, well, okay. I'll, I'll get to talk about minimal modules later, but. <coughs> the, but I think you are four, four steps ahead of me. Okay, now we start with lecture one about Kodaira dimension. <clears throat> so the, the, the first thing I, uh, that I want to do, and that's what Kodaira dimension is about, is find something analogous to the degree of the canonical sheaf of, of a curve. So, for the time being, K will just be a field of characteristic zero, not necessarily a number field. There are troubles in positive characteristic. Some of them are due to inseparable maps. Some of them are due to issues of uh, Hironaka's theorem not, not being available. So I'll stick with characteristic zero. <coughs> Suppose X is a smooth projective variety of dimension D, and L is a line bundle on X. Uh, so I'll, I'll define something for general L in, in a minute. Uh, a specifically interesting line bundle is the line bundle uh, whose divisor class is called the canonical divisor class KX. <coughs> so the line bundle with divisor class KX is the sheaf of um, top degree differentials on, so you take the one forms on X and take the this exterior power, that's D is the dimension of X, which is again the same thing as the dualizing sheaf of X. So in higher dimension you don't take omega one X, which is an interesting sheaf nevertheless, but you take its D exterior power, which is a line bundle. Since you, Omega one is a vector bundle of rank D. Um, it's the cotangent bundle of, uh, of X. Uh, then it's this exterior power is a line bundle and that's what I want, I want a line bundle. And the reason why this is particularly interesting is that 
uh, I'm teaching you here about birational geometry. Sections of this line bundle are a birational invariant. And in fact, sections of OX of any positive multiple of are birational invariant for any M. I guess M bigger or equal to zero. And the reason for that is explained in, in Hartron's book. It's a very beautiful result. If you have two varieties with a birational isomorphism between them, well, there is an open set in U such that this is a morphism, right? And this is an open set whose complement has dimension at least a co-dimension at least two. You can always uh, extend a rational map away from co-dimension, co across co-dimension one, namely up to co-dimension two things. If I have a, say, a differential here, uh, f of z, dz1, dzn, or whatever, I can pull it back by the usual differential forms pull back. That's one point where I need, oh, well, here I don't need uh, uh, Curtis. Uh, this, is, this works in general. <laughs> I can pull it back. That gives you a differential on U, which is a section on a line bundle, of a line bundle, which is well defined away from co-dimension two. But U is inside X and X is non-singular. So it, any section of a line bundle, any uh, locally it's just a, a rational function. Any rational function which is regular away from co-dimension two is actually a regular function. It can extend across co-dimension two. Therefore, you get, uh, for any section here, you get a unique section here. So you get an injection from sections here to sections here, and of course, this is symmetric you get. So I, I guess it, it must be in the exercises that I wrote, but I gave you the, the main. This is in hard churn. So, so this is a particularly interesting line bundle, in particular, well, it's, it's definitely an, an, an analog of what we did for curves, and moreover, it's a birational invariant. The sections, sorry. Its sections are a birational invariant. Here's a fundamental theorem. It's in Itaka's book, and uh, it was pointed out that uh, the construction was earlier made by Moishes and before Itaka introduced it. For in a particular case. So, uh, the theorem says that if you have a, a, an algebraic variety X and you have a line bundle, then sections of powers of that line bundle, I hope you can read up there. The, so, for, you take the, so a, little h dot is the dimension of the space of sections then the dimension of the space of sections grows polynomially. So I want to write, uh, what I want to write is that uh, H naught of X L to the N is like uh, N to some power kappa times some coefficient plus lower order term. Unfortunately, that's not entirely true, but it's almost true. So, so gross polynomial means that the, the leading term in, in this is well defined, even though it doesn't quite look like this. So you divide by n to some kappa, and you take the limb soup of the fraction, then that limb soup is well defined for, uh, so there's, there's a particular kappa, integer kappa, for which this is a well defined and non-zero number. And that's assuming, well, that's assuming yes, so note that there's, there's an assumption here. If there is some section, then it, then it grows polynomially. This kappa is called the Itaka dimension of X with the line bundle L of the pair X comma L. And in particular, if you don't write L, you mean the, the canonical shift, Kx. <coughs> so, 
the Kodaira, that's called the Kodaira dimension of X. Yes? Uh, in characteristic zero, but not in characteristic P. Yeah, so in characteristic zero, the only uh, abstraction for this being really a polynomial is, is, uh, is periodicity. If you take a, if you take a, a, a line band, the, the, a torsion line band on an elliptic curve, let's say, or any curve, then it won't have sections unless you take multiples of n, where n is the order of the torsion. And that, that's basically all that, that messes up polynomiality in characteristic zero. There's a paper of Katkowski which shows what happens in, in, in characteristic P. Uh, I didn't bring the precise uh, citation, but you can find it. <coughs> so, so this is the Kodaira dimension. I, I, I made this assumption that there is a section somewhere, and uh, just to be complete, we need to make a definition of the Kodaira dimension. Uh, otherwise, and the, the commonly used definition uh, is that if, if there is no section anywhere, for positive integer n, then you, you call the Kodaira dimension minus infinity. And the reason you use minus infinity, if you, if you think about it a bit, you'll think that the right number to put there is minus one. But then if you think about it a bit more, you'll see that minus infinity is a better choice for, so that's, that's a kind of a little annoying problem with, with these things. That, So where does this number come from? What is this kappa? So kappa is an integer. And one way integer come in, in algebraic geometry is as dimensions of things, right? Uh, so kappa is a dimension of something, and that's what it is. So, so uh, assume that, uh, let's assume that we don't have this negative Kodaira dimension. Assume that the kappa XL is bigger or equal to zero, namely there is some section of L to the n for some n, then for sufficiently high and divisible n, so avoiding distortion business, the image of the rational map from X to the space of sections of uh, the projective, projectivized space of section, so there's a canonical map for any line bundle which has some sections. The image of the uh, uh, that map does not depend up on n up to birational equivalence. Namely, if you replace n by 2n, the image will be birational to the image for n. And because of that, I can attach all sorts of numbers to this line bundle with x, namely the numbers that are attached to this image, birational invariants of this image. In particular, its dimension is a birational invariant. So the dimension of this image is kappa xl. And it's a slightly elaborate exercise to show this, and it's an exercise in the lecture notes. That's, that will, you know, that, that takes some work. It's definitely explained in Itaka's book, and a little, a little more uh, sketchily in uh, Voita's book in the beginning. It, I think he mostly refers to Itaka's book, but you can get the gist of it. <clears throat> The birational equivalence class so the, of this image, N, N0 is the first time that this occurs, the, of this uh, image is called uh, IXL, I for Itaka. It's the Itaka image of uh, XL. And this rational map from X to IXL is called the Itaka vibration of X uh, with the line bundle L. This is always a, it's a rational map, its generic fiber is connected and um, it is geometrically connected and it's, it's uh, so it serves to be, co it, it, to, we call the vibration. Um, the particular case where L is the canonical bundle, this is called the Itaka vibration just of X, you just don't need to mention L, written uh, X going to I of X, you don't need to mention L. And here's a key definition that I will uh, come back to many times. Uh, the variety X, I think Chinkel has already introduced this last week or the previous week. 
The variety X is said to be of general type. X is called, to be, uh, called a variety of general type if this Kodaya dimension equals the dimension. This is a very bad name, general type. It stems from the fact that in the surface case, all the other cases can be completely classified, and the general type case is kind of a, a zoo of wilderness. <clears throat> so it's, it's not a particularly good name, but we are stuck with it. I just uh, emphasize here that this, this Kodaria dimension of X, because the space of section is Barashan invariant, then the image of that space of section is a birational invariant. So the Kodaya dimension is a fundamental birational invariant, a very rough, not very precise. Like you can, for each M, you can take just the dimension of the space of sections. But uh, the kind of a rough and, uh, and uh, still useful uh, invariant is the Kodaya, birational invariant is the Kodaya dimension. Uh, I'm told it's more correct to say Kodaira dimension, but I, I revert to bad Japanese once in a while. Some examples. Well, okay, so before I do this, uh, let me give one example that is So if you take any variety and you take an ample bundle, <coughs> then, then for some power of L, it will have enough sections to map X isomorphically into projective space. So the Itaka dimension in this case is just the dimension of X. So let's uh, look at a couple of examples. What, what do we have with Pn? Well, what is, omega, what is omega of Pn? That's a formula that you have in Hartron, which says that, uh, that, that omega Pn is of minus n minus 1. Or maybe I should write minus n plus 1. So that, since it's negative, there are no sections. And no power of it will have sections. So there are no sections at all for positive n. So the Kodar dimension of Pn, oh, that's written there. Kodar dimension of Pn is minus infinity. If you take an abelian variety, because it's a, it's a group, the shift of differential is a, is a trivial shift. You can pull back by, by translation. So, so for any power of n, nkx is just a trivial shift. So it has just one uh, dimension of sections. And the, therefore, the image by the rational map is just a point. So the Kodaira dimension is 0 for an abelian variety. If you take a hypersurface, so uh, D is a hypersurface of degree n. Then, then omega d, well, this is something that is true in general. This is the adjunction formula. It's omega pn twisted by d restricted to d. That's the adjunction formula. So this is O d of minus n plus 1. Oh, I shouldn't say n. This is not n, of degree d. Minus n plus 1 plus d. So we can read immediately out of this what is the Kodaya dimension. If d is bigger than n plus 1, then this is ample. Therefore, the Kodaya dimension is uh, n minus 1, the dimension of d. If uh, d is equal to n plus 1, like, an, like a cubic in a plane, the, the, the canonical shift is trivial. Therefore, the Kodaya dimension is 0. If d is less than n plus 1, you have a uh, Kodaya dimension minus infinity. There are no sections at all. For curves, the Kodaya dimension is exactly determined by the genus. Uh, if g bigger than 1, it's 1. If g equals to 1, it's 0. And if g equal to 0, then it's minus infinity. Uh, OK, let me just say this last thing. This is one of the 
little exercises that you have in your, in your uh, lecture notes, uh, the Kodara dimension of a product with the product line bundle. You have two varieties, one line bundle here, one line bundle here. You can pull back the line bundles to the product and tensor them. That's called the exterior tensor product. That's this funny <coughs> thing here. Then the Kodara dimension of the product with the exterior product line bundle is the sum of the Kodara dimensions. That's called the easy additivity theorem. And you can easily, because it's easy, this is not as hard as the previous exercises. In particular, the Kodara dimension of a product variety is the sum of the Kodara dimensions. This is where minus infinity is important. This is where minus infinity is important because if you take Pn here, the Kodara dimension of, of Pn cross something is, stays minus infinity. So you check, check that. Yeah. So in order to prove this, you need to be careful about the, the, minus, the, the, the case where there are no sections. Okay. I think uh, it is a good place to stop. <laughs>